Thank you for joining me. God bless you. Uh, today, uh, we'll be moving on to a different topic from uh, what we did last time. The last time on Harvest Feast, we dealt with an all-important uh, topic, and it came in form of a question. Uh, does he know you? Does he know you? For some of us who were in attendance or who saw the video or listening to the audio, I pray we've pondered on that question to be sure if indeed he knows us. Today, we're going to be going into a different topic. And before we go ahead into that topic, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. Father, we bless your holy name for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We commit this program into your able hands. And we ask that you take absolute control. Let every hear that will hear this word, Father Lord, let it have that impact you want it to have in their lives. And let everyone be blessed as a result of listening or watching this program. For your own glory and for their own blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, today we'll be moving on to a whole new topic. And it's titled, Jesus Christ, the giver of life. Jesus Christ, the giver of life. It sounds so simple, but as we go on and we expand on it, uh, I believe God Almighty will expose that which we need to learn today so that we can see why if any life does not have Jesus, it's not worth living at all. Our Bible reading for this uh, sermon today is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 8, and I'll read from verse 20, I'll read to verse 25. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected, in, uh, subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with bad pants together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the false fruits of the spirits who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not a hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope, for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Well, going through this uh, Bible passage, the long and short of this we have just read is that God Almighty in his wisdom and power has made everything in life not to be fulfilling in itself. I've not said not fulfilling. God is good always. But in itself, it's not fulfilling for, for, for by itself. The world system and all the creation have been made corrupt through the sin of disobedience. And all long for a relief that is coming for normalcy to be restored. We know what happened. We read it in the Bible, what happened in the Garden of Eden. In short, life is in chaos because of sins. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, 17 explains how God had to cut the ground for the sake of Hagar. When the ground was cut, the mankind, the environment, the world itself, as it were, became cursed because God Almighty cannot behold sin. We know that. We know that. And this chaos has started ever since. In non honesty, because God is good, and we know there's no evil in God, God had a plan right from the beginning. And this we have in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God knew what Satan had kind of accomplished by deceiving Adam and Eve into the sin of disobedience. But God made a statement, a prophecy that was profound that indeed his seed, the seed of the woman, talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who crushed the head of Satan. And that exactly what took place over 2,000 years ago. Now, before we go on, there's something very paramount I want us to understand. We need to get into the definition proper of life. Life. So I ask you, how do you define life? According to the dictionary meaning that I just got somewhere off the internet, and I know it's general of, you know, how you dis uh, define life in secular sense. So to say, life is the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. If you are listening to me carefully, you will understand that that definition is not complete at all. It's short of the main ingredient that holds up life. This definition is actually from tangible characteristics, what you see, using both natural and social science approaches. It fails to see life beyond physical death timeline. And that's a very great error in that definition. It's my, my opinion. And at best, superficial in its approach because that definition does not really bring out what makes life to be called life. It has only looked at the physical realm, how things function, and then you can say it's got life in it. It didn't talk about the source of it. It didn't talk about how it will end. It's only stopping at death. And in the real sense, the life we are talking about, for the purpose of this sermon, we are looking at the life of a human being. The focus is on humans today, not on plants and animals. This is because human life is unique, as man was created in God's image and likeness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 it says, Then God said, let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness, that is telling you that man is unique indeed. God is good. So the meaningful definition of life actually should focus on its origin and what makes it what being called, what makes it being called life. And this only can be found in the word of God. I read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 so that we see actually the source of life. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. I'm going through the definition of life so that we understand. We're going back to our Bible reading, but we need to know why indeed <clears throat> everything as we see it today Everything, as we want to say it or regard it today, is decaying. It's decaying. People in, of chemistry, in chemistry, they call it entropy. The degree of disorder. How things are decaying by second because of the cause that was placed 
on the ground for the sake of Hada. That was as a result of disobedience. So we are giving the definition so that we understand what life is. That is the only sense of going through all the Bible passages we are going through. Life, according to the Word of God, goes beyond physical death. It's a continuum that has its origin, functionality, and relevance connected to God, the giver, the, the giver of life. So, when you define life, life should be defined from the perspective of its origin, functionality, and its relevance has to be all the time connected to the giver because that's how it's got meaning from the word of God. From this background, we cannot define life simply this way. It may not be so simple, but we can put it in a simple form. Life can be defined as a gift of God. It is a gift that has its intended meaning only in God. That is life. It's a gift that has its intended meaning only in God. It is not a gift that the recipient has a full understanding of, for it is a mystery of God. And when we say mystery of God, we are not talking about something spooky or something weird. We are talking about God's awesomeness, God's power, and God's, God's uh, majesty that cannot be unraveled by human's mind. That's what we are talking about. So don't misconstrue the word mystery with what people would like to say in the world. Using it in the word of God, it's a bit, you know, very deep. And as we go ahead, you will see what exactly the mystery of God is. I'll read from the book of Colossians chapter 2. I'll read verse 2, then I'll stop at verse 3. It says, that your house may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to the up to her riches or the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What does that tell us? This is summing up that indeed the mystery we are talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. As we go ahead, we see more of it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24b, all things were made. Oh, I'm sorry. Jesus is the power and wisdom of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Jesus Christ is the power and wisdom of God. And all through the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, we see how the, the mystery of God is made known through the revelation of Jesus Christ, who came to redeem mankind. Reading John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. That is talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see the definition of life, why I told you earlier on that you cannot separate it from its origin. And when people try to live life separated from its origin, the origin is Jesus Christ. Guess what happened? Chaos happened. You cannot live life outside of, its, of the peace of God and think you have life to its fullest. It's not possible. It doesn't just work that way. Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6, I have the way, the truth, and the life. No one comment unto the Father except by me. We need to understand it. This is so profound. It's further defining life. Jesus himself is life. So we can see that you cannot in any way talk about somebody having life. Oh, they will say, a life, the life is living. Well, if that life is outside of Jesus, unfortunately, that's not a life. That's not a life. It's something else. It is not a life. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to verse 12, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. 
He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I think that's that's pretty much a no, no, no brainer. It's so clear, like ABC, that a baby will understand that. If you want to believe the word of God, that he who does not have the Son does not have life. Because the Son, Jesus Christ, he is the source of life. He himself is life. Amen? In summary, from all those uh, Bible passages we have read to define life, the mystery of God that was hidden in the Old Testament, the prophecies and everything that was given in the Old Testament, but now revealed in the New Testament, is Jesus Christ. And He is the life we are talking about. He is the life we are talking about. Amen? Now, going back to that Bible passage we read, that is Romans chapter 8, starting from verse 20 to verse 25. I, I summarize the whole thing to let us know what that Bible passage is saying is because of sin of disobedience, everything has been in chaos ever since. And God, who is rich in mercy, has his own plan. And his own plan is to restore things back to normalcy. And that can only be done by the power, it can only be done by the, by, by the authority of God Almighty himself, by his wisdom. And the power and the wisdom of God came to be revealed to mankind in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we understand quite well where we are going now. That God Almighty indeed laid out his plan so that mankind having blown it, will not remain miserable for all of eternity. With this, he revealed in time his plan, his mystery, in the person of Jesus Christ. And life came back to mankind. And that Bible passage we read is explaining to us not only mankind, even the creation, all things, they are in state of chaos because of that cross that Adam and Eve incurred upon creation. So as we go ahead, we understand why Jesus Christ is the only one who is able to give life. Jesus Christ is the source of life. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment we can only have for us to say we are living. Looking at that Bible passage, everything in life, like I said, has been judged for the purpose of redemptive plan of God. Everything we see today, we look at it today, be it properties, whatever name it, everything that we see will experience newness. Everything will be made new. That is the plan of God. Even starting with mankind, coming into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That newness starts there. And the Bible says there will be new hearts, there will be new heaven, even there will be new Jerusalem. Everything will be made, will be made new. Second Peter chapter 3, from verse 11 to 13 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, looking at all the things we are looking at, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasten the coming, of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements we met with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. I'm not trying to paint any gloomy picture here. For those people who like to pick uh, preaching or Bible passage, they like to choose and pick. Uh, hear me out. What we are saying here is not that God has designed life to make human beings and the environment miserable. No. God did not do that to make us miserable. The only thing that happened is God himself, in his power, in his authority, in his wisdom, has to find a way of normalcy for creation, starting with mankind. So for things to come back 
to the very first state it was when it created man, created the environment before mankind messed everything up from the sin of disobedience. Things, creation and everything has to go through this process of decadence, process of decay, process of instability until Jesus Christ is revealed. And that happened over 2,000 years ago. And now, what is left for those people who are outside the gate is to see those stretched hands of Jesus Christ. And to say, yes, here I am. Take me. And he will take them. Let's quickly go through some Bible examples. To see people who lived life where they, had, they were and how they responded to life. I'll take about two or three examples of those people that we have read about in the scriptures. First of all, I'll take from the Old Testament. And that will be Job from the book of Job. Job. As we can see, the Bible called causing a righteous man. It presents the perspective of a true disciple of God in the whole testament. When I say God, I'm referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Job seemed to have it all, then suddenly he lost it all. Let's hear his perspective when he was money, that is looking at life from the things. He had the world and everything that was destroyed. Let's see his reflection. His refle reflection goes in Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Man who is born of a woman of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does, and does not continue. You can see how Job viewed it. When he saw the emptiness and the uselessness of life. Now, Job reflecting upon the hope he had in God. Listen to this in Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. This is the real perspective of how we should look at life. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. That in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. I want to be sincere by spending a bit more time on that Bible passage. Because if I rush down, then we may not catch something very important there. How my heart yearns within me. That's from Job. That is talking about the true witness in the heart of Job, knowing his Redeemer. He was saying that all those things that God destroyed, that God destroyed from the storm and everything, when he was being made an example of somebody that was faithful, he reflected that all those things meant nothing compared to the feeling he had within himself to see the face of the Lord. Another example was Solomon. Solomon saw it all. He had it all and dropped it all. Let's hear his reflection of life. After ch chasing, after wrong things in, dis in disobedience of God's instructions, it says in verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. This is what uh, Solomon said. He said, For what as man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful. Can you hear Solomon? He was speaking at how he lived his life in disobedience, following the dictates of of the world, the environment, just having fun without anchoring himself into the source of life. Can you see the way he's pouring out? See what he's saying. For all his days are sorrowful, and all his work, burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This is also vanity. So what he has said here is, there's no life in things the world has to offer. Period. That's all he said. That you can't find any life in anything, in everything that world sister 
the system of the world has to offer, you cannot find life here. Now, here Solomon again, when he came to himself, let's hear his conclusion. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, it goes this way. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. I mean, this is, this is straightforward. I don't know why a lot of people miss it. And I don't know why people want to make this passing world their home. It's really unbelievable how people view life. But from all the, the Bible passages we have been uh, looking at, we see good example of how people can come back to themselves to know that the only source of life is the Lord Jesus Christ. We read of the case of a rich young um, uh, ruler in Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 to 22. The rich young ruler, he has, he has riches. He had riches, he had influence, and kept the law. You know what he missed? He missed the greater part of it. He missed salvation through grace by faith. Let's see his reaction. This is what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. That was a straight instruction. You see, some people may misunderstand this uh, Bible passage. Jesus Christ was not trying to strip him of his uh, uh, assets or properties or whatever you want to call it. It was because Jesus knew his heart. His heart was anchored in the wrong place. He placed his hope not only on his influence and the material things he had, he also placed his hope on the obedience of law. He missed it all. He didn't get the understanding of the real source of life. Now, finally, I mentioned the case of the great Apostle Paul. Let's hear his own perspective about life. Remember the case of Apostle Paul, how he first lived his life? He was fervent for God, but in the wrong way. But when he found Jesus, he knew the truth, and he did not waste his time. See what he says. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is so clear as well, that when you know that the true source of life is in Christ Jesus, you need not waste your time. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, verse 3. This was towards the end of life of Apostle Paul, really. Let's hear what he has to say. He said, But what things were gained through me, this I have counted lots for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lots for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. From the examples of, of all these perceptions I've been mention, mentioning, look at what Apostle Paul was saying. From these examples, <clears throat> we can see that the only leveler in life, the only thing that makes life meaningful is to see life through the lens of Jesus Christ. If you see life through the lens of Jesus Christ, then you are talking the real thing. You are not deceiving yourself. It is the life that we need to live. It's supposed to be the life that has come conquered sin, death, and hell for us to say we are living. That is the life according to the word of God that is lived according to the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now listen to this second part. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That is the life I'm talking about. That is the life everyone is supposed to live. And that is the life that is worth living. Thank God for the gift of natural life. When we all came, but we know what happened. 
could have been messed up. The gene have been polluted. But the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That is the truth. This means everybody that has received the natural gift of life through God's creation requires a spiritual gift of life by being born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. That's found in John chapter 3 verse 3. For the Bible says, Genesis chapter 3, like I mentioned the other time, from verse 1 to verse 7, we can see the account of how man blew it up, like I've said. And we need to understand, after man made that big mistake of not obeying God, sin entered into the world. And we have to note that we now, you and I, we sin not because we are sinners. That's not why we sin. We simply sin because we are sinners because we naturally sin. Sin is in our DNA. Human beings are sinners because naturally human beings sin. That's why they are sinners. We don't call uh, human beings, uh, okay, we sin and that's why we are sinners. No, naturally. Sin is in the DNA of human beings. And that's what Jesus Christ, our Lord, came back. He came to this world to save us from the power of sin, death, and hell. And the Bible says, the first Adam became a living being. And the last Adam, in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. We want all to receive that life that is in Christ Jesus. Let's conclude this sermon by looking at some Bible passages. And this I will use to challenge those watching me this morning. If you are yet to receive life, if you are yet to understand what life is, I want you to consider your way this day. You cannot have life outside the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not possible. You cannot change the word of God. That's why Preachers are sent out all the time for those people who are yet to realize the reality, the truth of the word of God. So that when they hear the word, maybe they will be able to change their heart. And I'm preaching to you this morning. I'm preaching to you wherever you are. It may be morning, it may be evening, it may be night. Wherever you are watching this program, that you consider your way. If you have not had Jesus Christ in your life, you do not have life. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That is so simple. Nobody can change that. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 says this. Jesus said to us, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That is, if you are in sin now, you are dead in your trespasses, if you turn your way around, you will live. That's what Jesus is saying. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He's talking about eternal life. Let's key into that, that's the truth, and that is the word of God. I'll read from Luke chapter 9 again. I'll read verses 24 and 25. See what the Bible has to say. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. If you want to live your life anyhow, you are done for, unfortunately. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. If you live for Jesus, then you are made. Then you are made. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself destroyed or lost? That would be a colossal waste. You see, the way some people want to take life, they want to take life as if they are in control. I have the news for you, you have no control. The moment you drop dead, you are gone. So what remains is where you are going after you just close your eyes. And the Bible says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, to be outside of this body is to be with him. But for those who are refusing, the Bible has another thing to say to them. To be outside of this body is to be in hell. You don't want to go to hell. That is the word of God. Nobody can challenge that. We are to live by the authority of the word of God. If you have defined yourself your own way, you want to live your own way, 
Unfortunately, that will be to your own destruction. And I pray you don't get destroyed in Jesus' name. I'll, I'll close it by reading from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. This is what Jesus was saying to, to, to those following him. And I want to challenge you this morning. Indeed, if you are a follower of Christ, my, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, still talking about life, and they shall not perish. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them from the hands of my Father. I and my Father are one. Praise the Lord. You see, it's all said and it's settled. Don't try to manipulate what is not. Take the easiest route, although we know, like the Bible says, the road is narrow, but I'm telling you, there is assurance, even as you walk on that narrow path, there's assurance of redemption of your body. And now you will live your life not under the condemnation of sin, not anymore. You live your life as free as you want to live it, according to the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is my prayer for you. That is the life we are talking about. The Bible says, in rounding up, He was often rebuked, and hardens his neck, will suddenly be destroyed. I pray, if you are listening to me now, and you have not given your life to Jesus, I pray you don't experience that sudden destruction in Jesus' name. I want you to see the reason why you need life. Please, see the truth, and turn your way around. The Bible also says in Psalms 34, it says, see the mercy of God. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. He's talking about those whose hearts are yielded, not those who want to just do things their own way. And save such as are a contrite spirit. That is the word of God. Repent today and give your life to Jesus. It's simple as ABC that people want to get it wrong. And I pray as you make that decision, even as I pray now, there's a page coming up Click on that page. You see the instructions that we've listed out for you. Follow the instruction to give your life to Jesus. And I can tell you, you will always remember this day for good in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you again. Thank you for your word that has gone out. Thank you for indeed you are the life that came to this world. You, you brought the light into the path of men. And whoever comes to you will never walk Walk, walk again in the darkness of life. We want to say thank you for that provision that you have made for us. And Lord, we pray for all those who have had this sermon this day, who are yet to know you. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that the light of the gospel will shine upon their hearts and their hearts will be illuminated for you and they will turn away from their sinful path and come to you. For we are praying in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And I will see you next time on this program. Until then, remain blessed.